Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Jennifer Lombardo. Um, I'm on our community relations team at Rothman Orthopedics. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us. I hope everyone is, is staying safe and trying to get back to somewhat normal, um, uh, somewhat normalcy. Um, our lecture that we're going to be given today is by Dr. Justin Sai. Dr. Sai is one of our foot and ankle surgeons here at Rothman. Um, he currently sees patients out at our office in Manhattan, our Gramercy location, and also in Harrison, New York, and Westchester County. This topic he's going to be speaking on today is what's new in foot and ankle surgery. Um, just a reminder, if everybody could just keep your phone on mute during the presentation. Um, and also, if you have any questions after the lecture, if feel free to type it into the chat section at the bottom of the screen. You should see a chat button there. You can type any questions, and Dr. Sai will get to them after the lecture is over. Or feel free to unmute yourself, and you can ask it out loud. Again, I am going to record the lecture, so then I can um, send it back to everybody tomorrow. Um, and if anybody missed it, again, everybody can rewatch it, or feel free to pass it along to anybody you like. Okay, Dr. Sai, you ready? Yep. All right. Thanks, Jen. Uh, thanks uh, for organizing this, and thank you all for uh, your time this evening. Uh, as Jen said, uh, I am an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon with Rothman Orthopedics, and uh, I'll just be talking about some of the uh, innovations in foot and ankle surgery uh, that I use in my practice and I believe contribute to uh, improving patient outcomes, which is what, you know, obviously we're all about. So, um, you know, I'll start by saying that I have no disclosures that are relevant to this talk. Uh, just a little bit by myself. Uh, I was uh, raised in uh, an area right smack dab in the middle of uh, Suffolk County in a town called South Setauket. Uh, I then went on to do my undergraduate education at uh, Cornell University up in Ithaca, then spent the next uh, nine years of my life uh, uh, in medical school and orthopedic residency training uh, at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn. And then finally, I chose to do a, a year uh, of uh, sp subspecialty training uh, in foot and ankle fellowship in uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, a University in Philadelphia. So in terms of what I treat, uh, I treat uh, the whole variety of what can go wrong with the foot and ankle. And uh, this is part of the reason I chose foot and ankle as a subspecialty. Uh, you know, on any given day, I can be seeing uh, a patient with arthritis, a patient with a deformity such as flat foot uh, or high arch, uh, be seeing bunions, uh, fractures of all types involving the foot and ankle, uh, athletic injuries, really a huge variety uh, in, in both only, uh, not only uh, operative uh, pathology, but also non-operative treatment as well. And uh, I do see uh, patients, uh, uh, both pediatric and adult patients. So there are some challenges that are unique to the foot and ankle when you're dealing with uh, injuries and surgical treatment. Uh, obviously, it is the lowest part of the body. So uh, it's uh, very difficult, uh, or more difficult, I should say, uh, to get blood there than anywhere else. And uh, also, it's difficult to get blood back. And that is sort of a perfect setup for having issues uh, uh, with uh, swelling, issues with wounds, and just uh, slow healing injuries. By its very nature, the feet touch the ground. They are dirty. Uh, they don't get washed to the same degree as the hand. And so, uh, naturally, they are more prone to infection uh, when you're talking about surgery. Uh, anytime you have an injury of the foot and ankle or you consider surgery, there's a high likelihood that uh, there will be at least some amount of time that you will be non-weight bearing, which is obviously challenging. Uh, and of course, if the right foot's involved, uh, there adds an extra challenge of not driving as well. I, uh, I envy my hand colleagues because uh, a lot of times, uh, like this picture on the upper right, they'll walk out of uh, his room and there'll be all smiles and able to be fully functional with a tiny incision on their wrist and ready to go. Uh, meanwhile, a lot of times uh, my patients will be coming out uh, looking like the uh, picture on the bottom right. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's a necessity uh, of the profession and no. um, Don't come over. Uh, just something we uh, have to learn to deal with. No. So just an outline of what we'll be talking about today. Um, I'll be talking about the sort of five topics. The first is uh, the way I treat Achilles tendon tears. Uh, the second uh, is uh, using arthroscopy and endoscopy uh, in my practice. The third is using uh, biologics. Fourth, the concept of using sutures hardware. And the fifth is uh, sort of a, a topic that's dear to me, uh, and it, that's uh, using a total ankle replacement. And uh, before we get started, you know, I think it's uh, important to uh, note that uh, new does not always mean smarter or better. We were able to get to the moon using a simple pocket calculator. 
Uh, and uh, as a result, we have to keep that in mind, uh, that new technology, uh, you shouldn't run to embrace it. You should only really use it once it's been proven to uh, sort of affect patient outcomes and has to make sense for you. And in the end, we all have the same goal. That is to uh, make patients better uh, and to uh, minimize harm. So, so let's dive into percutaneous Achilles repair. So uh, Achilles, the Achilles tendon is the largest and strongest uh, tendon uh, in the body. And uh, it's that big, thick tendon in the back of your ankle that you hear about uh, athletes uh, uh, sustaining injuries to, uh, but also uh, weekend warriors, and it's responsible for push off. There is a weak area uh, about four to five centimeters above the heel where it inserts. And the reason they have this, uh, people have this weak spot is because of the pattern of blood flow. Uh, there is great blood flow above this area, great blood flow below, but sort of in the region uh, about, again, four to five centimeters above the heel, there's what we call a watershed region, which is uh, a weaken. And this has implications for not only why people get injuries here, but also for healing and for uh, potential wound uh, complications. So uh, in terms of who gets these injuries, we do see these more in males, uh, male patients. Um, we see these in... Uh, uh, peak uh, between the third and fifth decade. People who take a uh, class of medications known as fluoroquinolones are more prone to get these uh, injuries as well, uh, as are patients that have steroid injections that are done uh, incorrectly in the area or have diabetes. And, and finally, the most likely is just uh, people that have had repeated injuries to the area that finally culminate in uh, a full-on tear. Now, traditionally, uh, and this is still the gold standard, uh, it's been uh, if a Achilles tear uh, has been deemed surgical and the patient elects to go for surgery, this is the way it's been treated, uh, open repair. And it's not hard to imagine how this is done. Uh, you simply take suture on one side, you suture the opposite side, and you tie them both together, making sure that you match the tension to the opposite side. Obviously, this requires that uh, if, if you see on the picture on the right, the incision has to span not only uh, the rupture itself, uh, but also enough of the tendon above and below to get those strong uh, uh, knots in so that you can tie them down and have a strong repair. Now, the benefit of doing surgery, while we do any surgery, the benefits have to outweigh the costs. So the traditional benefit, although this has re recently been kind of debated in the literature, but um, uh, it has traditionally been a lower re-rupture rate uh, with surgery compared to without surgery. The uh, traditional knock against surgery, or uh, one reason you should not consider doing surgery, is the relatively high likelihood of a wound issue. And it's uh, been described as high as 10% in the literature. And uh, the reason why it has a relatively high rate of wound complications compared to other procedures is Again, the concept of the watershed zone. Uh, because there's not great blood flow in the area, that not only leads to an increased likelihood of tear, uh, but also leads to poor skin healing in the area. And uh, the difficulty of the situation is compounded by the fact that the skin's very close to the tendon in the area. So an infection of the skin or a skin um, incision that doesn't heal nicely can very quickly lead to uh, infection of the tendon underneath, uh, infection of the sutures that uh, are in there, and even uh, infection of the heel bone. So that really leads to the question of whether this is worth it, uh, especially in, in higher risk patients who are at uh, higher likelihood of developing these complications. So this is uh, one way uh, that we can kind of lower the likelihood of this happening. And uh, uh, this is called a percutaneous technique. And percutaneous simply means through the skin. So, um, you know, I won't go through the details, but basically instead of having to make a, a large incision to get the sutures into uh, above and below the tendon, we use this kind of uh, jig or device uh, through a small incision to be able to pass those sutures in without having to make that large incision. And so, again, you are lowering the chance of a, uh, a wound healing issue happening and subsequent infection, uh, while at the same time, keeping that strong repair. And studies have shown that indeed using this uh, repair technique is just as strong as using an open technique. There's an even added benefit that you can modify this technique uh, and actually secure the tendon also to the bone, which I believe uh, also gives you added day one strength. So um, again, you're minimizing risk by lowering the uh, potential wound complication rate uh, and subsequent uh, infection rate 
and at the same time providing the same benefit of lowering re-rupture rate. So um, this is one way that's uh, really been uh, a, a method we can uh, reduce the risk of the patient. And this is uh, just sort of a, a timeline of repair. So on the left side here, I'll play the video in a second, uh, I'm doing what's called a Thompson's test. You squeeze on a calf, and usually when you squeeze on a calf and the Achilles tendon is intact, that should cause the foot to kind of poke down or poke down uh, uh, and touch the ground. Uh, and when the Achilles tendon um, is torn, it does not do that. So I'll just play the video for you on the uh, right over here, sorry, on the left. Uh, and this is an Achilles tendon that is not intact. So you can see I'm squeezing the calf here and the foot is not going down. Now, uh, I'll move on to the video here on the middle. Uh, and this is after we've uh, repaired the uh, tendon. And you can see now how, um, you know, we squeeze the calf and that uh, causes the foot, the plantar flex to go down. And on the right side, you'll see a typical uh, incision uh, for a, a percutaneous repair. So compared to the previous picture that you saw, obviously much smaller. Uh, and uh, I would argue that this is actually even on the larger side for uh, what we do. This patient just needed a larger incision just to be able to get to the tendon end that was kind of retracted up. Uh, but this is, again, typical for what you might see for a percutaneous repair. So let me just get through here. Next, we'll talk about uh, the concept of arthroscopy or endoscopy. Now, arthroscopy and endoscopy refers to just using a camera inserted into a joint or space with small tools to treat pathology. And by no means is this a new technology. It's actually been around since 1919. Again, the same concept, uh, the smaller uh, incision that you can use with this technique uh, means that you can minimize risk. So whenever something can be done uh, through an uh, arthroscopy technique uh, and have the same kind of results, that's obviously the way we should go. Uh, what's changed for us is that one, uh, we're understanding different ways to use uh, uh, arthroscopy so the applications are, are better and more better understood uh, and the technology certainly is better. The cameras, uh, the uh, video resolution have uh, really made this a lot easier for us to use. So this is a typical setup for an arthroscopy. So on the left side of the screen right here is the leg, the bottom part, this is the sole, the foot over here and this is typically where the surgeon would stand. In one hand, uh, through a small incision, about, about half a centimeter in size, you have the camera, which is connected to the light source and the water inflow. You're pumping water into the joint to make sure that the area stays clear and the joint stays expanded. And on, uh, on the other hand, you have whatever instrument you're working with inserted into a hole about the same size. Uh, and that instrument could be everything from a shaver to a grasper uh, to a little hook or probe, uh, whatever you need to accomplish what you're trying to do. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously you can switch uh, portals uh, uh, whenever you uh, need to. So this is one example of how uh, we use uh, endoscopy in this case. Uh, you know, this is a patient, uh, an x-ray uh, from the side showing a patient with an extra bone called an ostrigonum. And if you can see what I'm pointing to here, this is an extra bone in the back of the ankle uh, that never fused to uh, uh, the bone right here called the talus. Usually this doesn't cause people issues at all. Uh, most of the times it's an incidental finding on x-ray, but every now and then you'll have a, uh, an athlete that has issues. If you can imagine uh, athletes that re require them to be kind of up on their toes a lot, like uh, ballerinas or dancers, uh, every time they go up on their toes, uh, this can get compressed between the heel bone uh, and sort of the ankle joint right here. In those cases, uh, it's advisable to take this out if that's going to be the cause of the, the pain. And obviously you can take this out through an open approach. There are safe approaches described where you make an incision, you dissect down to the bone and you take it out. However, uh, this also can be taken out uh, through uh, endoscopically, uh, endoscopically uh, through two small incisions. And I, I believe this is a safer way to do so and obviously minimizes soft tissue trauma and allows the patient to get back there uh, uh, to athletic activity sooner. So on the left side, uh, shows kind of the uh, view we're looking at uh, on a camera. So this shows in real time uh, the bone uh, right here on the left side here. And on the right side, you'll see this tendon coming down. This is the tendon that runs right alongside of it uh, that helps bend the big toe down. And certainly when you have this unstable bone here, uh, it can rub against that tendon and cause issues as well. So first half of the video, you'll see the tendon moving with the bone there. In the second half, you'll see uh, that tendon there with the bone removed, and you can see how much um, uh, more room it has to move around and less likely uh, it, it is uh, to be rubbing against it. 
So uh, again, this was able to be taken out through uh, two small incisions on either side of the Achilles tendon, which obviously not only uh, minimizes risk to neurovascular structures, but also allows the patient to get back to uh, their activity uh, sooner. On the right side here, you'll find that uh, the bone is no longer there. Uh, you know, in terms of using it for different applications, so uh, whenever we see an ankle fracture, uh, we s used to simply fix it. And uh, usually patients do just fine. Now, there, every now and then you get the patient that no matter how good the, the x-ray looks, the bones heal, the hardware looks like it's in a good position, uh, for whatever reason, they don't do well. And, uh, you know, it was hard to understand exactly why in a lot of these patients. And now we're finding that this could possibly be attributed to the fact that at the same time they sustain an ankle fracture, they also sustain damage to the cartilage of the ankle, which you normally don't see uh, the full degree of uh, during ankle fracture repair. Normally, you just look at the bones that are fractured and you put them in position and put plates and screws. And so one uh, thing a lot of my colleagues have started doing and I've started to embrace is uh, using an ankle arthroscopy at the time of ankle fracture fixation surgery. And this lets you catch these cartilage uh, lesions uh, before they become a problem and actually address them at the time of ankle fracture surgery. In addition, you can use it to kind of judge how good of a job you're doing in sort of fixing the ankle fracture and making sure everything's as precise as possible, not only looking from the outside in, but also looking from uh, inside of the joint. So again, uh, this adds maybe about 10 to 15 minutes to the procedure, but it really allows us to improve outcomes, uh, I believe so, uh, with minimal risk. Finally, uh, you know, this is kind of uh, in the horizon here, but uh, usually an arthroscopy setup involves this huge tower on the left side over here, uh, and generally it's done inside the operating room. Um, there are kind of like commercially available uh, 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 arthroscopes nowadays that are, are small, uh, come sterile and disposable, and uh, you attach them to a really a, a remarkably high resolution uh, monitor. And this has implications uh, where we could possibly be using this in the office uh, to actually look inside a joint uh, safely uh, in the office setting, which is uh, really ha has great implications for how we're going to be able to catch these uh, injuries uh, sooner. Uh, next, uh, we'll just uh, touch base uh, with uh, biologics. Uh, biologics are uh, products used to augment the body's healing potential. I start thinking about using biologics uh, when we have patients and conditions uh, that are at our higher risk of not healing. Um, a lot of times uh, these can replace uh, the gold standard uh, of a biologic and that's autograft. The autograft refers to taking uh, a graft from your own body to augment healing. And again, our gold standard is taking a bone graft from our hip to do so. So um, just describing a typical injury, uh, this is called a Jones fracture. Again, the concept of a watershed zone, uh, there is great blood flow above this area called the, uh, um, uh, we're called zone two of the fifth uh, metatarsal. So there's great blood flow here, great blood flow below. Sort of in this area here, the blood flow is not so great. And as a result, uh, it's not only at a higher risk of uh, fracturing in certain populations, but also once it fractures, it's at a very high risk of not healing. Bone needs blood flow to heal. And as a result, uh, um, traditionally it's been described as uh, having a high rate of non-union. And certainly if you do surgery uh, for this, you wanna make sure you get this done correctly the first time. You don't wanna uh, operate on a patient, um, put them through you know, six weeks of non-weight bearing followed by rehab and uh, you know, multiple doctors with this only to tell them at uh, two months that this fracture doesn't look like it's healing. So we wanna try to do what we can to heal, uh, get this to heal uh, the first time and avoid another surgery. And uh, one way uh, we can do this is by uh, increasing uh, healing in the area by introducing biologics. And you know, traditionally, like I said, bone graft in the hip has been used. Now this kind of shows the uh, harvest for a larger operation that certainly doesn't have to be this big. Uh, but again, traditionally it's been associated with uh, another incision or the hip crest. Uh, it can be painful, it can lead to wound issues, uh, but these are the best cells and you wanna harvest these cells somehow. Um, uh, this is what I call getting uh, um, hip harvest light. So you're basically harvesting the same cells, but you're doing, through, doing so through a small uh, incision and not even an incision, more of like a, a needle stick. Uh, and you're taking the syringe and uh, withdrawing uh, that spongy um, uh, bone. And that spongy bone subsequently gets uh, spun down in the back table. 
and then that concentrates uh, uh, the healing potential bone uh, into a small concentrated uh, product that's handed back to us. And then we subsequently uh, inject this or introduce it to the fracture site. Uh, again, this whole procedure takes maybe about uh, five, five more minutes uh, at most. And certainly, uh, although um, there's no uh, long-term, uh, you know, double-blinded studies yet to show that it helps, Certainly, I can't see why it would hurt, uh, and uh, it has the potential to really uh, help out in these uh, difficult situations where we're worried about healing. This can also be done for other uh, conditions uh, in the office setting as well. Uh, and uh, just another example of uh, biologics, uh, there is a condition called osteochondral lesion, and that's where you have unhealthy cartilage and bone underneath in the bottom part of the ankle joint. Traditional treatment has been to make some holes in the area after scooping out the unhealthy tissue. Uh, as you can see here on the bottom uh, left side, you kind of isolate it to stable borders and you literally make holes so it punches through and causes bleeding. The thought is that that bleeding then stimulates the formation of a, uh, a different cartilage type that uh, is usually good enough. Uh, it doesn't uh, ever recover the natural cartilage you're born with, hyaline cartilage, but uh, it produces a type of cartilage called fiber cartilage, which uh, sometimes uh, can withstand uh, the normal uh, stress of the ankle joint. Um, but there are products nowadays that we can use uh, that can actually uh, mimic uh, hyaline cartilage and restore the cartilage that uh, you were born with. And uh, so uh, this is one method that we've uh, kind of adopted biologic use for. You do the same thing, you kind of scoop out the, uh, the bad tissue, uh, you stimulate bleeding, but then you kind of put in these products, uh, two of these products with Novo and Biocartilage, and uh, the thought is that it can uh, regenerate the hyaline layer cartilage and provide a more natural uh, recovery. Next, uh, we'll talk about the concept of using sutures hardware. I uh, adopt this uh, concept in two ways in my practice. One, uh, I use it for flexible repair, Two, I use it to protect my repair uh, using all the methods and uh, allow early rehab. Now these uh, sutures aren't uh, the yarn that you might see in a sewing kit. They are synthetic materials with really remarkable strength. Uh, and more importantly, they have low reactivity. They uh, are mostly inert and don't cause allergic reactions or reactions to the soft tissues around it. Uh, so it's sort of a good combination for use. And uh, like I said, they can be used as either an alternative or an adjunct to the traditional uh, metal plates and screws that we use. Um, one, me one way I use this is for management of uh, syndesmotic injuries. And this is the same thing as a uh, high ankle sprain. Uh, you might have, uh, for those of you that watch college football, you, uh, you might recognize this uh, quarterback who sustained a high ankle sprain uh, sort of late in the season uh, and had surgery and, and was able to return, you know, uh, about a month later. Uh, and um, basically a high ankle sprain is an injury to a ligament that connects the two leg bones at the level of the ankle. Uh, and you can see here that is the fibula and the tibia. Over here on the picture, uh, it looks like it's just kind of two bones touching each other, but this is an actual joint. There's cartilage uh, on either side, just like, you know, your shoulder or your uh, knee joint, and they glide against each other. And so if you don't stabilize this, this can lead to an unstable ankle, which not only uh, is painful, but can lead to arthritis and issues with the ankle later on. So the gold standard again uh, is screw fixation. You put the two bones together in the position they're supposed to be, and you put screws across and uh, you let it settle in. And what happens is the ligament will scar in over time, uh, and then the screws uh, almost become unnecessary. Uh, these screws are not meant to withstand, since it is a moving joint, they're not meant to withstand uh, the multiple thousands of steps that you're going to take uh, after sustaining this injury, and so they will break over time. There is, uh, whether it's, you know, a couple months in or years down the road, uh, you take an x-ray uh, 20 years later, they're still in. Uh, it'd be remarkable if they were still intact. And so, although this is debatable, most surgeons that perform the surgery will schedule uh, a planned removal of hardware uh, a couple months later once everything is healed up. And again, this is fine. I mean, it's been done that way for a while. Uh, but recently, uh, you know, I've been uh, adopting the concept of using a suture bridge. Uh, and uh, this is several advantages. One, it allows us to uh, get flexible repair so that you're keeping the normal bone movement there. 
it is a joint and putting two screws across it really never made much sense since uh, you're keeping it rigid and, and it can no longer move the way it's supposed to. Uh, so uh, by using suture instead of a screw, you're allowing the bones to move as they should. Uh, obviously, since it's suture and uh, you know it's not gonna break to the same way a broken a screw might present, there's no need to remove it. And most importantly, it's just as strong. So um, this is kind of what it looks like on the bottom left over here. It's, it's pretty simple. You have a button on one side that's made of metal a bridge with suture and then uh, another kind of button uh, like device on the opposite side. This patient in the middle over here has a, a, um, something called a masonu fracture or high ankle uh, injury or, uh, and you can see here how the ankle is not really settled underneath the uh, tibial plafond here. It's not congruent. It's wider here than it is here and typically these two bones should overlap a lot more. Here you should see there's there's no overlap whatsoever. And so we use this device to stabilize the ankle uh, in this patient. So uh, you can see here, this is about uh, four months later, the fracture up top uh, is healed. And we've reestablished a congruent ankle with uh, a normal overlap between the two bones. And this patient never had to have the suture removed, never had to have another uh, surgery. And he subsequently went on to uh, run a marathon about six months later. So a uh, really effective way to uh, treat these type of injuries. This is the other application I was talking about, the concept of an internal brace. And this is how uh, I protect uh, uh, some of the surgeries I do. So uh, I think about it like a seatbelt. It's not an artificial ligament, but it protects the repair that you do and prevents it from stretching it out before it's healed. And uh, this allows us to get these patients back to physical therapy and activity uh, with less stiffness uh, and um, a recovery uh, period. Uh, so as opposed to a high ankle sprain, uh, uh, you know, a low ankle sprain involves the ligaments involved in the outside of the ankle. Uh, and uh, these occur, uh, I'm sure most people have uh, either experienced one themselves or know somebody that has. This is when your foot buckles in uh, and you get a huge swollen, uh, you know, soft tissue in the outside of the ankle. The majority of these go on to heal without surgery uh, or even, uh, you know, seeing a physician. However, in some cases where, you know, it's a very severe sprain, uh, or somebody that's had multiple sprains, it can lead to issues where the ankle is constantly buckling and causing problems and pain. And that's when we start to think about uh, possibly treating this with surgery. Again, I'll mention the term gold standard a lot because it, it, it does work. Uh, but the traditional surgery has been to simply take that ligament, put the foot uh, in a shortened position. So you uh, point it to the outside and point it up and then uh, repair the ligament that way. Uh, the problem is uh, you have to immobilize these patients. Uh, you cannot have that ligament stretch out at all. Otherwise, you're going to be left uh, uh, the same way you were before surgery. Uh, so I was just finishing up on the concept of using the internal brace here. So again, uh, I think where we left off, we were talking about the procedure where we uh, repair these ligaments on the outside of the ankle. And, um, you know, traditionally, again, uh, you have to mobilize someone for six weeks afterwards or around that time. And this prevents uh, the ankle from stretching out, which is obviously what you don't want. Um, of course, you can't do physical therapy during this time. Uh, the ankle gets stiff. Uh, certainly, uh, you get calf atrophy. Uh, but if we use an, uh, the concept of an internal brace, it really uh, allows us to protect our repairs. So I feel more confident letting these patients uh, really start physical therapy and putting weight on it as early as uh, two weeks. And uh, that's a world of difference. You know, two and six weeks, um, uh, patients are, are light years ahead uh, at that six week mark uh, than they would be without. So uh, that's really been one way we've uh, been able to use uh, quote unquote sutures to uh, enhance our uh, repair and accelerate our rehab. Um, the uh, next slide or next topic, uh, final one is uh, that of a total ankle replacement. So. Arthroplasty is the general term we use, uh, which means joint replacement. And, uh, you know, we use this for severe arthritis, and everybody knows somebody that's had a hip replacement or a knee replacement. Hip replacements are remarkable. It's been termed the uh, surgery uh, of the century for a reason. Patients that have had long-standing hip pain uh, on the night of surgery are able to walk around uh, a lot of times pain-free, and it's really remarkable. The knee, uh, the same way, uh, recovery is not quite as easy, but uh, it's just as well established. You hear about shoulder replacements, elbow replacements. Uh, but when it comes to ankles, the word you usually hear is uh, fusion, and there's a reason why. 
So ankle arthritis is different from arthritis of the hip or the knee. It is not usually a result of wear and tear. Typically, ankle arthritis happens uh, because uh, there's an injury in the past that was either uh, treated not optimally or not treated at all with surgery, uh, or somebody has a condition where uh, they have an autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid arthritis or something like hemophilia where uh, it causes breakdown of the cartilage in the ankle joint. Early orthoplasty designs were a disaster. These implants failed. Uh, and as a result, uh, combined with the fact that fusion, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, did so good, that really it was for a large part abandoned or not spoken about a lot uh, for, for many years. And uh, a fusion remains the gold standard. And what a fusion is, is a, a, a surgery that basically uh, removes the, uh, the bad bone, bad cartilage, and um, uh, sacrifices range of motion, uh, but gives you no pain. So. It reduces pain reliably, uh, but obviously you lose your range of motion. Uh, in addition, since you're uh, reducing, uh, you're eliminating motion at the joint you're, you're operating on, that increases the load on the surrounding joints, which uh, leads to a breakdown sooner and adjacent joint arthritis. And so uh, arthroplasty was kind of revisited. And um, when it came down to it, all arthroplasty kind of shares the same uh, technique and goal. You're taking out the bad bone and cartilage on both ends of the joint and you're replacing it with metal uh, on both ends and a piece of plastic uh, uh, to glide on uh, between the two metal pieces. And, and that's really the same basic design for every orthoplasty that you'll see, uh, whether it's a hip replacement, which you'll see over here, or a knee replacement. Uh, and basically, you know, um, it has to be able to withstand normal weight bearing mechanics. Uh, every time you take a step, uh, it has to be strong enough to withstand uh, however thousands of steps you'll take uh, for the rest of your life. Because you really want to only do the surgery once, uh, uh, because going back in, uh, obviously, is more difficult. In addition, you have to be able to implant this in a way that it uh, mimics normal joint uh, alignment uh, that you would see in a natural joint. So... <clears throat> Uh, we learned from our early failures and we kind of uh, copied our, our hip and uh, knee design um, uh, analogs and uh, advances in materials, implant design, and really technique have uh, led us to this point where there's been multiple generations of total ankles now and we've reached the point where uh, really it's really can be considered a uh, equivalent uh, to uh, a joint fusion or an ankle fusion in, in reducing pain. Uh, and um, uh, at the same time, uh, maintaining the range of motion. Some of the features of uh, uh, or implant designs that you might see that we've kind of adopted from our hip and knee colleagues, um, you can see her here on the left side. This is the tibial tray or the piece of metal that goes on the upper part of the ankle joint. And you see how there's these, this kind of like spotty metal here. Uh, that's called trabecular metal. Basically, uh, it allows uh, ingrowth of um, uh, uh, bone into these uh, small uh, surfaces uh, and it allows uh, uh, a more increased strength of bonding between the metal and the bone and a lower chance that it can uh, uh, become loose over time, which is a huge problem uh, in early designs. Another example you can see here uh, on the x-ray to the right, you might think that this um, tray over here looks like it's kind of rubbing into the fibula bone over here. Well, it's actually designed, if you look at the cross section, it's actually designed with a little cutout over here that accommodates for that. So uh, really mimicking more uh, natural joint mechanics. Lastly, uh, you know, there's the concept of patient-specific technique. Um, this is a, a way of, of doing surgery where you can actually uh, use uh, a CT scan uh, and 3D printing to uh, help you uh, deal with a patient's anatomy. Not everybody, uh, or not every ankle arthritis is created equal and everybody has unique anatomy. And whether that's bone cysts or bone spurs uh, uh, on the surface of the other uh, bone, everybody's gonna be a little different. And this sort of helps us um, uh, uh, account for that and, and to uh, basically make it as standardized of a technique as possible. And so uh, the way we do this is we, um, uh, scan the patient's anatomy with a CT scan. We then send this to a lab uh, who analyzes it, produces this beautiful uh, map and template for us, and sends back these 3D printed custom blocks that are matching that patient's anatomy and that patient's anatomy alone. 
You then use these blocks at the time of surgery mounted on their bone to guide your bone cuts so that you produce that straight surface uh, that mimics uh, and allows for uh, a normal uh, axis of implantation. And uh, they also provide a template, so there's really no surprise in surgery. And what you want to hear uh, after surgery are things like routine, straightforward, no surprises. And this is uh, a technique that allows us to do so in a joint that can oftentimes be very variable uh, between uh, patients. And so I think that's it. Does anyone uh, have any questions? Uh, uh, either you can say them out loud or I can open up the chat over here. Um, let me just figure out a way to do that here. Any questions at all? I can see the chat box too, Dr. Stey. Yeah. You know, I apologize for, for, for the technical difficulties, everyone. Um, again, we didn't miss anything for those that, that were able to join back. We started, um, we picked up where we left off. Um, but I will, again, send a recording out to everybody. Uh, we have one question. Anything new on bunion surgery? Yeah, so I mean, uh, bunion surgery is one of those things where, uh, as people might know, um, uh, it's, it's one of the more difficult things we do. And a lot of people may think that bunion surgery is just shaving the bump and um, it's a simple walk in and walk out. When in reality, it's, it's one of really the more complicated procedures in anatomy that, that we know. And um, that's usually secondary to the fact that, again, some bunions are, uh, have a, a larger deformity than others, so it's not just one operation. Uh, and a lot of times the soft tissue uh, is uh, cause a lot of swelling after surgery and, and cause a lot of pain and wound complications. Um, in terms of new advances, uh, there are ways of doing bunion surgery nowadays where you can kind of minimize uh, the incision uh, that is necessary. This is called a, a MIS or a minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and um, this is something that uh, if you're comfortable doing so, um, really through very small incisions, you can uh, cut the bone and move it over and put in the screws that you need to with an incision that's really a, a fraction of what you would normally use. And so again, uh, just like the gold standard uh, of Achilles is opening it up, the gold standard again remains an open incision, but there's ways that we can reduce the risk of complications, uh, which this would by reducing the incision area, uh, that's something we would certainly adopt. So I, I would say that that's probably the uh, most eminent uh, new development in bunion surgery, uh, that, and that is the concept of a minimally invasive uh, uh, surgery. Uh, looks like we have a question here on uh, uh, BFRT for uh, rehab of non-op Achilles tears, and um, uh, whoever I type that, uh, just clarify what B BFRT is. Um, uh, it's kind of bl I'm blanking on it right now. I'm terrible with acronyms, so um, let's see, is, uh, is Fred still here? Could, could always email me as well and we can follow up afterwards. Blood flow yeah. restriction therapy, uh, okay, I uh, apologize for that. Um, I'll be completely honest with you. Um, uh, I have not heard much about it. I mean, I've heard about it, but I, I don't really, uh, I'm not really familiar with the literature. But when it comes to rehab of uh, non op Achilles tears, uh, my thought is always if it works or and it has minimal chance of causing harm to the patient, uh, that is certainly a, something I'd always be an advocate for. So, um, you know, I, I've heard about it before. I'm not personally familiar with it, uh, but um, uh, it, it's certainly a, a great option, especially these patients that you're treating non-operatively and you want to make sure they heal uh, to the greatest degree possible. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? If anybody else, you know, has any other questions or um, has to call Rothman for any reason, you could always reach out to me directly. You can email me your questions. I will connect with Dr. Sai and get those questions answered. I'm also going to send our scheduling phone number uh, for Rothman again in case you have any questions or need to schedule an appointment if you prefer to call Rothman. That's our direct phone number. Um, um, again, for those that, that missed it, um, we are seeing patients in the offices at our Manhattan location um, right now and also in Harrison, Westchester County. Um, 
We are also doing televisits for those that are not comfortable with um, you know, coming into the offices as well. So um, that's also an option for you. Uh, but again, thank you everybody for joining us. I will send a link out of the presentation to, um, to everybody um, tomorrow at some point. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any other questions. Thanks, Dr. Sai. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate have it. Have a great night, everyone. Take care.